Good morning and welcome to the regular Bible class. For some of us, it's Sunday morning. For some of us, it's Saturday morning because that's when we're uh, preparing this ahead of time. And our subject this morning is a wonderful woman in the Old Testament uh, by the name of uh, Hannah. Hannah, barren and yet blessed. Barren and blessed. This is the Sunday morning adult Bible study with uh, the sponsorship of Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. The information is there. You're invited on Sunday morning at 8.30 and 10.30, either in person or on the internet at trinitydelray.org slash live or you can pick that up later on by going to YouTube and put it, putting in Trinity Lutheran Church, Delray Beach, Florida, and you'll find all of the videos posted there. Good morning. We're diving into the book of First Samuel. I have never taught it before, and most of you have never had specific lessons out of First Samuel before. Let me say that the, this is a time of transition, a time of transition, the historical setting of a of somewhere. Okay, around, I'm, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. To, good to hear you and see you. Good morning. To, this is uh, Pastor Clem. That's uh, you hear his voice, but maybe maybe you don't hey. see his uh, picture. They're, they can't all show on the screen at once. The historical setting is around 1080 BC. The period of the judges is ending, and the time of transition is getting Israel ready for the time when they're going to demand a king, and then their troubles will multiply, as we can read on later. They have expectations. They want to be like all the other uh, people that are around them to have kings to rule over them and fight for them. They have the same expectations that people of any era. Uh, don't we want stable crops and healthy animals? Yes, we do. Uh, we go to the grocery store to, uh, to take advantage of that, but it starts on the farm. And all of us want children and growing families and healthy families and you know, most of the people of the world want freedom to do what we want. The problem with doing what we want is that it too often is sinful wanting, isn't it? The period of the judges is ending, and the last verse, the last verse of the book of Judges, would someone read that? Judy, you're a good reader. Uh, you know what? I'm, I've lost my picture all of a sudden here, Pastor, but I'm, I'm sorry here. I don't know what happened. Um, you can uh, work on that. Um, I may have to go out and come back in again. That's, um, that's, that's fine. I'll let you in. I'm not uh, sure really. Someone else read uh, Judges uh, 21. I can months. hear you, but I can't see you. All right. Do I have another reader? If not, I'll read it. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The sinfulness of the nation was the only thing that was very healthy. You and I have expectations also. You know the expectations that we have? What expectations fill your mind and heart today? Anybody, chime in. Hmm. What expectations do you have? Oh. About my, my expectations are to finish my grades for my students, which are due by uh, Monday. And uh, we'll be finishing a very interesting uh, school year with virtual, virtual uh, teaching and virtual learning at Boca Raton High School. Now, where are you now? 
I didn't hear the question. Where are you now? Where are you now? Uh, you are at home, aren't you? That's uh, right. right. That's right. What expectations fill your mind and heart today? Uh, mine are just uh, short, a uh, real short term. It's to be able to just get off my campus and back out into the world again. <laughs> I think you mirror the expectations of many. Uh, and uh, expectations know, about your family and, and about your health. This, right, to, to follow up on doctor's appointments that have been postponed and for, I think, probably all of us uh, in many ways, uh, if they haven't been absolutely essential. Um, you know, and just to, to be able to, like you said at the start, to be able to hug and touch people again. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, uh, you know, that intimate uh, touching, which is so important um, oh, yeah. survival. We are starved for that. As a nation, we usually are starved, but now we've been cut off almost entirely. And we want to, as you've already as indicated, get out of our period of uh, self-isolation. And um, here's the big one for, for us, to get into that building that we call the church. Now that's the church building. And be together again every Sunday. I hope we're so starved for that, that we never intentionally miss it again. Let's move on. The expectations that we might find. Never listen. <laughs> what, Christine? I have uh, also something to say in the Go sense ahead. of what you just were talking about, expectations, in that I have to recalibrate my life, my future, if there's any future, Lord willing, because I thought I'd just be traveling, and that's not going to happen now. No. And so I have to recalibrate and, and wait for the Lord to give me a new passion. All right. Uh, something that uh, you'll be praying about. Yes. Anyone, anyone else? Expectations. Let's look at the book of 1 Samuel. The expectations that we can expect to find there Unfortunately, we're going to find some expectations that are not fulfilled. And that's, that's the sure. tension point, right? Yes. We're going to find unfulfilled expectations that bring sorrow and disappointment and conflict. And they can challenge our faith. So that's what we need, isn't it? Some, some expectations that don't come about. And the application, one of the applications that I'm looking for, and I hope you will, is the application that says, you know, God promises to hear our prayers when our expectations aren't fulfilled. He's, he's waiting. He's in the waiting room. <laughs> uh, I let him in and tell him, well, here's the thing that, that's bothering me, Lord. And then the second application is this. What does God want to take away from us in order to give us something better? What does God want to take away from us? Something we want. In order to give us something better. That's a hard one. Let's see how that works out in this study. Thy will be done is the key to answering that application. Easy to say and hard to carry into practice, isn't it? Be careful when you say thy will be done. Look what happens. <clears throat> right? And because of the 40 minutes, I'm going to move a little bit faster and not have as many tangents, believe it or not. And we'll Where talk are about you? I'm at home in the office. Oh, okay. Yeah. Th this woman of faith, her name, Hannah, means favor or grace. And we're going to see, I hope we'll see, that Hannah's name foretells her future. You know the nursery rhyme, don't you? There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children. She didn't know what to do. Well, that takes us back uh, 
60, 70 years, or maybe less when we told the rhyme to our children. There was a young woman who was barren of children. She had none, but her husband's other wife had some. And that led to problems in the home. I'm sure you can see the kind of sorrow, disappointment, unfulfilled expectations in Hannah and her husband's other wife, Penina, who's there in the background with all of her children. A man with two wives. There was a man named Elkanah from Ephraim. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And I want you to consider this. Number one, he had two wives. Well, look, Pastor, since he had two wives, it must be okay. No, there's a lot of sin in the Bible. And that doesn't mean sin is okay. And God had designed marriage at the beginning when he said to Adam, here is your wife. He didn't say it in, in those words. He said it's not good for men to be alone. And he brought Eve to Adam and Adam knew his wife and they had children. But this man had two wives. But Hannah had no children. And that is the tension point in the beginning of this story of Hannah. This is how it goes. Now, do we have a reader for these uh, two verses? Uh, I'll, I'll make an attempt. I'm back here. So. It, it's Penina. Yeah, Penina. Okay. Penina used to pro provoke Hannah grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. She wept and would not eat. The provoking happened in part because the people of that day believed that if a woman was barren, there was some curse on her. There was something wrong with her and that God was punishing her. And that is the possibility. He doesn't say that in the text. The reason Penan, Penina provoked Hannah because, because Hannah was barren. Because, because, what does it say? Because the Lord had closed her womb. Yes. Second, this had been going on year after year. Is every time they went up to Shiloh to worship, and this was probably the time they went up to the Feast of Booths, uh, Penina provoked her. So Hannah wept and would not eat. Um, you have any guesses to what the diagnosis would be? What might these symptoms mean? Depression. Depression. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You didn't think depression was a 20th century thing or a 21st century thing, did you? No. Oh. It goes way back. Hannah's husband is another story. The text says he was troubled. And he has a lot of troubles. A man who says to his wife, Hannah, why do you weep? <laughs> you have to wonder, where is he? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Ah. Uh, I thought it was just today's husbands that just don't get it. <laughs> so are you meaning on Saturday or are you meaning on? Well, we're recording on Saturday and we're going to play it back on the YouTube video on Sunday. Hannah's husband, Elkanah, was troubled. Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Well, uh, Elkanah 
we need to have a, a counseling session. But I want you to know one positive thing that is back in verse 5. When they went up to the feast, they would share in the sacrificial offerings, that meat that was cooked was served, a part of it anyway, to the people who came to the feast. That's something that people don't consider. Uh, what do they do with all those offerings? To Hannah, because she didn't have any children. Because he loved her. We could say, even though the Lord had closed her womb. Hmm. So we'll, we'll give Elkanah that, okay? Pastor, quick question. Yes, John. Um, or Robert or Bobby. I mean, um, my question is, uh, when I read that earlier, um, it's a double portion just... Um, Double uh, her her other the other wife or the the wife's family and I I thought my goodness it's he's sort of hurting his uh, his kids there, but he didn't short his kids. He didn't short. His he kids. gave okay. one wife twice what he gave the other wife is the way I read it. Okay, that's that's what I would say. And maybe he was very he was generous overall too with uh, with a lot of things. So we'll give generous is not the right word, but I, yeah. I, I agree with you. He was he was willing to give her a little extra. Okay. So let's talk about Hannah again. There was a barren woman. She didn't know what to do. What would you do? Whoops, wrong, wrong button. What would a barren woman in our day do? Anyone? Go to school. <laughs> Go to school. <laughs> All right, and then she'd have a classroom full of children. I have known single school teachers who have not just 30, but 300 children. <laughs> Every week they have 300 children because mm. they teach. But their womb Gosh. is not bearing, either they're single or they have not been given the gift of childbirth. What else would a woman in our day do? Oh, they'd go look at in vitro fertilization, um, surrogate pa surrogate parents possibly, um, foster fostering or adopting. Um, there are many possibilities. There are many possibilities. Yeah, Hannah may have asked the question. We don't know, but many women would have asked, "Why? Why, Lord?" Why? Why can't I have children? Why hasn't the Lord blessed me with it? Okay. And this is the first of many unfulfilled expectations in the book of First Kings. When we are troubled by unfilled expectations, I suggest to you it's time to pray. God will hear your complaints, your grumbling, and my grumbling. I'm guilty of that. Please don't nod your head, Janie. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, if you're missing something, instead of complaining to your spouse or your children or the church, talk to the Lord about it and then leave it there. It's time to pray. So how does God answer our why questions when we have expectations that haven't come true? How does he answer them? Well, he often sometimes gives us something even better than what we ask for that we can't even begin to even see um, in our future, something totally different um, that he can put into our lives. Um, it's one thing that can happen sometimes. And many times it is a better gift than what we thought we thought we wanted. Yeah. Any other examples? Hmm? I think we also need to wait and be patient. Sometimes he, it seems like he's testing our patience, but uh, okay. we need to just be patient and uh, work it through. Think about it. Listen. Listen instead of talk. Well, that's hard. Uh, yes. open, open the book of prayers, the book of Psalms, and read them 
as I have often prescribed to you. There are mysteries in life, and one of the greatest mysteries in life is the God who said, be fruitful and multiply, sometimes closes the womb of some women or limits a man's ability to procreate, or both. Remember how the Lord opened the wombs of these women? I think you probably could list them as fast as I can click. Who are they? The women of the Old Testament who were barren. Elizabeth? Oh, no, not of the Old Testament. Um, Rachel, one of them? Rachel was one of them, Sarah, Rebecca, Sarah, yeah. and Rachel. They all had to wait for God to give them the children they wanted. And then there was, as you mentioned, Elizabeth in the New the Testament. New Testament. Mm -hmm. And that's a special case. John the Baptist, born of her. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mysteries of life. Many couples, because of this problem, carry emotional and spiritual burdens when they're unable to bear children. It hurts. So here's a question for you. Um, how common do you think fertility is in the United States? What percentage of women are not able to bear children? Hmm. I think it's one out of five from what I heard. Oh, okay. 20%. I'm, I'm Googling it though. <laughs> well, I, I did. I, 20 to 30 percent as a guess. I did that, and uh, the uh, year of 2019 10 percent report says about 10 percent, about six million pe women and, and of marriageable age of or, or running out of time. We've removed the 40 minute time limit on your group meeting. Oh, that's uh, very grateful. Uh, that's because of. Uh, the situation. What Thank time you. do you meet? At 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on Saturday. And then we do it uh, again by recording on Sunday. So what oh, about the men? Okay. Uh, well, in about 35% of the couples with infertility, a male factor is identified along with a female factor. That's interesting. Yes, so there's an overlap. And then about 8% of the time, the man is the identifiable cause and the woman has no problem. Just for you to consider, what was Hannah to do? She was a woman of great faith in God to accomplish whatever he wills to do for his people. I think your heart is in the same place. Your, your heart is in the place that says, I know that God is with me and he's going to take care of me. I, I just have trouble waiting. I pray and then it takes months or years for the answer to come. Mm -hmm. How well, many are, are coming? Oh, about six or 10 come into this room and how many tomorrow? Only the Lord knows. Yeah. So if the, what time does the uh, uh, church service? Or? At the church service will be tomorrow at 8.30 and 10.30, and you can watch it. Uh, your sons will help you set that up. You can watch it on, okay. uh, on the computer or on your phone. So let's talk about let's talk about what Hannah is going to do, Pastor. I want you to look at this uh, with us. One of the times that Elkanah took his family up to the house of the Lord to worship. Thank you, Hannah, for the example. She prayed. Oh, how she prayed! Hmm. And while Hannah prayed, Eli the priest was watching nearby. Isn't that interesting? At first, he doesn't interrupt. He's just there by the doorpost of the temple. It isn't a temple yet, pardon me. It's still a tent in Shiloh. Eli, the priest, is watching nearby. And I would like someone to read 1 Samuel 1, 9 to 11 right off the screen. Do I have a volunteer? I can do so. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, 
Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. That's quite a prayer. Now consider this. I've emphasized some words about the way in which Hannah was praying. What do you make of that? Deeply distressed. And she wept. There's an emotional content to her prayer. This is not, oh, I'm going to pray the Lord's Prayer in the morning and then get on my, with my work. This was a deeply felt need and a call to the Lord. So what is the difference, Pastor, um, of this she vowed a vow versus uh, we as humans sometimes make bargains with the Lord. Uh, yes. Is it, our, is it our heart and where our heart is, I guess, in, in, in making the comment that um, the Lord kind of judges us on? Uh, I want to tackle that right now. Okay. She vowed a vow. That's kind of a doubling. Um, it's more than she made a promise. And I want you to note that there are uh, some ifs in that sentence. Let me see if I can do this here. See this if? Uh -huh. um, nope. I don't want to spoil it. But uh, she vows a vow. Uh -huh. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. You give me a son, I'll give him right back to you. <laughs> Where are you meeting? Up, up, upstairs? Well, right now we're meeting all where we live, and then we'll not meet okay. upstairs until uh, there's no threat of the virus, okay? Thank you, Pastor. Hannah makes a vow, and a vow is a promise to God. Do not make vows lightly, because the Lord says if you make a vow, you have to keep it. One of the greatest and most important vows that most of us make in our lives is the vow to be faithful to God all the days of our lives. You didn't think of that one, did you? I bet most of you were thinking of the marriage vow, which is the first one I actually thought about. But then I realized before that is the vow that some of us uh, made at our confirmation. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of us never made that one, but God expects us to keep our vows. We ought to talk about that someday. But Hannah promised that if he would bless her, then she would give him to the Lord. There's that if again. All right, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> How about you? Uh, have you ever prayed with your promise attached to something like, I will do such and such if you, Lord, grant me this, what I really want? Or if you give me something I promise never to do or to do something. That's the vow with a condition. Mm -hmm. Who is holding whom to what? <laughs> I'm asking God to hold me to account because I'm making him a promise, but I'm still asking him for something in return. There's nothing wrong with making a vow with a promise if you intend to keep it. If you don't, don't make the vow. Just go ahead and do it. And then don't do, look around for the applause. <laughs> it's God's will that you do his will. What are you looking for? You have his approval ahead of time. So you're not getting more approval. Hannah's prayer, most probably we have often prayed in our hearts, just like Hannah prayed, her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. 
and therefore the priest Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Um, I can't get inside of that, why he thought that, but he did. And he said to her, how long are you going to go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. And what did she answer? Judy, would you read that? Okay, it says, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Troubled in spirit, pouring out my soul, she's weeping and crying out to the Lord, even though her voice is not heard. And she's speaking out of her great anxiety and vexation. Can, can, you, can you get even close to how this woman was feeling? It's hard for me to get there. And yet, just a little bit of witness. I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but last September, when I received uh, my diagnosis, I was troubled in spirit, and I poured out my soul before the Lord, and there was a lot of anxiety and things unknown, but as I've reported to most of you, the Lord has been blessing me with his medicine and good medicine and a good doctor. And that's all I'm going to say about it because I sent you the report last night. Thank you for your prayers. Anna's prayer. Eli gave her an answer, and I take this to mean that out of his office as priest, he was able to speak a promise from the Lord. That may be more than you can get out of it, but that's what I get out of it. In fact, the Lutheran Study Bible makes the same point, that when Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. He doesn't know what it is. He hasn't heard it. She did not tell him what was the content of her prayer. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Instead of judging me as a drunken woman. And then the wonderful report. What? What's the report? She becomes pregnant. Her face. She lost her depression. Her depression evaporated <laughs> yeah. because she believed the promise that Eli gave her. When God makes you a promise and you believe it, well. He gave her hope again. Hope is the word. She hope. didn't hold it in her hand. She didn't hold the baby in her lap. She held the promise. So what changes took place? We've already named them, haven't we? Now, what expectations may have come to her heart when Hannah believed her prayer had already been answered? Expectations. What's the obvious one? Anyone? She's gonna have a child. She is you should, going. Give, you should give thanks first, but often, oh, yes. we start, but often we start making plans already, probably in her case, thinking about the so-called, I don't know if the, you know, nursery or yeah, yeah. The tent in which they had kept yeah. all the children and the birthing tent and all those things she was going to experience um, Absolutely. suddenly uh, became real to her. The expectations, she, she was as good as having the the gift already. 
and, it, and, and certainly a song of thanksgiving. In fact, if you want to read, <laughs> you guys are way ahead of us. You will read her song of thanksgiving in 1 Samuel 2. They call that Mary's song, don't they often? It, um, is, it is very much like Mary's song. In Luke. So, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we ask other people to pray for us. We do it all the time uh, in our community of faith. And we, when we pray and ask someone to pray with you or for you, what expectations do you have as you pray together? And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. God's going to answer your prayers. And here is Jesus' promise. Oh, <laughs> something from the New Testament. What does Jesus say? Bobby? Maybe Bobby left us. Oh. Uh, did you want that Bible verse written, uh, read down there, Matthew 18, 19? Yes, please. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. You believe that promise? Yes. Don't doubt it. It will be done according to the Father's will. So how did the Lord answer Hannah's prayer? For one thing, uh, she acted. She didn't say, well, it's going to happen. I'm just going to sit here and wait. She and her husband did not cease to worship, as was their practice. Their practice was to worship regularly, wasn't it? Every year they went up to Shiloh to worship. So they rose up early in the morning and they worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. We also know that Hannah and her husband acted according to their faith that God would grant them a son. And this is a private little moment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Judy, would you read that? Um, and uh, Elkanah. El Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Songs of praise will rise from Hannah's heart. The Lord remembers. I didn't know he forgot. In the Bible, for the Lord to remember is to keep a promise, is not to forget your needs and my needs. The Lord remembered Hannah. He acted in accord with his will because it was his will to bless her with children. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, after which this book for Samuel is named. And names help us remember, don't they? We don't do it as often as they did in olden times to give someone a name that was in part a prophecy. Hannah's name means favor or grace, so now we see how that has come true in her life because her name, God's favor, and God's grace was upon her, foretells her future. She conceives and bears a son, and she names him with a meaning. Samuel means, I have asked for him from the Lord. In the Hebrew, the word Samuel sounds like God has heard or God hears. Well, next week, dear people, we plan to finish the first chapter, verses 21 to 28, and I am suggesting that you read for yourself 1 Samuel 2, the first 10 verses. That's this wonderful psalm of praise that we were talking about a few minutes earlier, and we're also going to jump into chapter 2, beginning with verse 11, as the child Samuel begins his new life with Eli, the priest. And Eli will be the second uh, individual that we're going to concentrate on, Eli, the priest. Well, here is the uh, little ad. Online, you can watch this Bible study on YouTube, and you can click on the Sunday morning Bible study, and you can also go to worship at 8.30 and 10.30 in person or online during live 
or afterward on YouTube. I want everybody to know that so that more and more people come and study and worship with us.